try to look inconspicuous. One of those things picked up your Uncle Rick once, and he was never heard from again. Penultimate mission on this column of the page, Apollo 12, comes after 11. We have Conrad, Gordon, and Bean. Great clipper ship highlights the crew's naval background. The dots here symbolize the three crew members. And this is kind of a unique photo here where we have the uh, artist conferring and sketching, designing the patch. Now also in the patch there is a fourth star, and that is because uh, Clifton Williams was originally assigned to the Apollo 12 mission, but unfortunately his T-38 jet that he was piloting malfunctioned and unfortunately lost his life in October of 67. So this is the star to commemorate astronaut Williams. So the official crew, yes, Conrad, Gordon, and Bean. And Apollo 12 marks the first scientific exploration of the moon. All the previous Apollo missions were the build-up and getting to the moon. Apollo 11 certainly was very politically driven, as much as a propaganda journey as an accomplishment of NASA, for sure. So now we're actually starting to change our focus into let's explore the moon. Now Paul Levin did bring back rocks and moon dust to explore but and left the laser reflector to measure the distance from the Earth to the moon. But this was a very concentrated effort on scientific exploration. We have a first here to mark in our book. First rendezvous on the surface of a celestial body, the moon. And this occurred during this Apollo 12 mission when the astronauts rendezvoused, met up with Surveyor 3. Surveyor 3 had been uh, sent to the moon before the Apollo launches, launches to survey, to see uh, if we land on the moon, are we going to fall through? Is it a solid surface, as we have indeed uh, theorized it should be? And so, first rendezvous, meeting up with something you already sent to a celestial body, that check mark is going to go for United States. Brought back from the surface of the moon with the Apollo 12 crew was a camera from the surveyor. Here's a little map of the tracks that the astronauts laid down. So the green is EVA-1, the yellow is EVA-2, not sure the name of this crater. I don't think it's left foot and right foot. I don't think it's the astronauts doing the hokey pokey, put your left foot in, right foot out. Uh, the astronauts didn't walk that far. I tried to investigate, but not sure what those are meaning. But quite the exploration in this area of the moon in the Surveyor uh, spacecraft. A couple items from Apollo 12 astronaut Peter Conrad, or Pete Conrad. And this is a flag and a Princeton flag from his Diddy bag, the little personal bag the astronauts get to take aboard the craft with them. And some of the lunar module notes. Good recovery of the astronauts. They have extra precautions here again, like the Apollo 11 crew, because they had gone to an alien world. They didn't have to stay in quarantine for as long as the Apollo astronauts of 11, but they did spend time in quarantine, as we want to make sure things are safe. And this is the lunar prospector that in the 90s was able to take a very close-up images of the area of the Apollo 12 landing. So right there is the Intrepid, so rather than the Eagle, the Intrepid landing site here. And their command service module was called the Yankee Clipper. Again, a shout out to all three of them being uh, naval uh, officers. Here's the Surveyor spacecraft and the crater that it was landing in, or had landed in. I don't know if maybe this is the left foot and the right foot. And then an extra zoom in on the Intrepid lander for Apollo 12. In January of 1970, the Apollo 20 mission was announced by Congress that due to budget cuts and the fact that we had been to the moon twice now, 
and that people in the general public were not as fascinated in space exploration or maybe more to the point beating the Soviets as it was felt that reaching the achievement of going to the moon certainly ended this race for space. So January 1970, the Apollo 20 mission was officially canceled. The astronaut's name down here, astronaut Don Lind, he was a professor at Utah State University for a number of years in the physics department, and I had the opportunity while I was teaching at university at Put Yoshu to have his grandson in class, and thus amazingly be able to acquire his autograph. Here is astronaut Lind, or the back of Professor Lind's head, as he is no doubtly getting some insight from Neil Armstrong, and then probably saying, hey, when you return, after your famous moon walk, give me all the greatest tips and tricks for uh, his at the time, thinking he would be one of the individuals to participate in a full-launched Apollo mission. The mission that follows Apollo 12 is Apollo 13. The logo for their patch here highlights the sun, referencing the Greek god Apollo, for which the program is named after. This ex luna scientia means from the moon, knowledge. And we have the earth in the distance as we approach the moon and the three horses, of course, representing the three crew members. The artist who designed this patch drew inspiration for the horses from a mural that was done by the artist Winter, and it is now in the James Lovell Federal Healthcare Center in North Chicago. It was purchased by the actor Tom Hanks, as Tom Hanks portrayed James Lovell in the 1995 Hollywood docufilm of the Apollo 13 mission. One of the companies that is highly regarded for their patches of the early space age was Lion Brothers Patch Company. And they would stitch very detailed things into their patches, kind of made them stand out and why they're highly prized, particularly in today's patch collecting. The significant thing that is uh, a standout in a Lion's Brother patch for the Apollo 13 mission is right here in the mane of the horse. You might be able to see the 13 that is stitched into the mane of the horse. So those are the highly coveted patches. So what you want to jot down for the Apollo 13 mission is it's the first and only aborted lunar landing mission. So the intent was to do the repeat performance of Apollo 11 and 12, land on the moon, do EVAs, collect samples, and this mission actually had much more science uh, investigation and experiments planned than Apollo 12. But unfortunately, they had to decide to skip the process of landing on the moon, much to the disappointment of all three crew members, and they needed to focus their mission on coming home safely. And we'll look at the various reasons for that ahead, of course. The astronaut names you want to jot down are Lovell, Swaggart, and Hayes. So... More often you'll hear Jim Lovell, Jack, which is a nickname form for John, Jack Swagger, and Fred Hayes. Now, the original crew was not with Jack Swagger. He was a backup crew member, but the prime crew member pilot was originally astronaut Ken Mattingly here. Ken Mattingly was part of the backup crew, like I said, with uh, Charlie Duke. And Charlie Duke had been exposed to rubella, commonly known in some places as measles. And Ken Mattingly had not had rubella as a child, and he'd been exposed to Charlie Duke, obviously, as they worked so closely together in training. And since he was the only one out of the prime and the backup crews that had not had the measles in his childhood, he was grounded by the flight surgeon, as you definitely wouldn't want to be sick with measles while you were in space. And so Swaggart was the person moved up from the backup to the prime. Traditionally, you would take the entire backup crew and make them the prime crew. These were a little different set of circumstances, and they were only a couple of days from launching. 
and it just made more sense to all parties involved to replace Mattingly with Swaggart as the pilot. There were no qualms, no concerns about his ability in just a couple of days to be the replacement because they trained so much together as prime and backup. So it was a great fit, and Swaggart likes to joke as it says here, I guess I had the shortest tour as a prime crew member of any astronaut. Two days and a bang. And we'll get into this two days and a bang here with the Apollo 13 mission. NASA astronaut with the most experience at this point was the commander of the mission, Commander Jim Lovell. Here is the Apollo 13 command service module, and it was named Odyssey. Lovell liked the name with the definition of the word being a long voyage with many changes of fortune and also a reference to the at the time very popular and still in today's society pretty popular film of 2001 a space odyssey the apollo 13 mission launched on april 11th 1970 at 1313 happens to be 1 13 pm a couple days into the flight, as tradition had been early on in the Apollo missions of being able to broadcast and the general public would view live and watch the astronauts as they were in space. Apollo 13 broadcast had a rather funny moment in here for you that we'll play. Uh oh, have you guys completed your income tax? How do I apply for the extension? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I, I got to, that ain't, ain't too funny, kinda, things kind of happen real fast down there, and I, I do need an extension. Huh. I didn't get mine filed, I'm really serious. And he was able to get an extension of his taxes that are due April 15th, as he certainly was out of the country out of the planet and uh, it's unfortunate the general public didn't get to see this hilarity as the television stations did not air the Apollo 13 broadcast as the public interest in watching the astronauts from space had waned already and we'd only been to the moon twice but for so many as I mentioned not too long ago that that was enough. We'd beat the Soviets now by going to the moon. So what was the appeal in this excitement about space exploration? So um, not a great feeling for the folks at Mission Control. And they didn't tell the astronauts that they had not been broadcast. They figured they would tell them when they got home. You know, keep them focused on their mission, at mission and recognize that they're in a very stressful situation. So we don't need to add to that. So about, I think it was six minutes or so after the broadcast as Commander Level and Swaggart were putting the camera away and running up to the next uh, series of tests they needed to do, we have this occur. There's the crew of Apollo 13, wish everybody there a nice evening and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back Good 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, I uh, have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Okay, yes, right, sir, we've had a problem here. This is Houston. Say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13. We're looking at it. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. So that's why Jack Swagger would joke that he was two days in a bang. And then all of a sudden the mission changed dramatically that all the thousands of hours that they put into training, uh, particularly for their moon exploration training, they put in five hours of training for every hour that they would actually be on the surface of the moon was gone as now the Apollo 13 mission became a recovery mission. The engineers at Mission Control initially thought maybe it was just a computer readout problem until the astronauts reported in that they'd heard this loud bang. And Jim's Love, Jim Lovell's line that Houston, we've had a problem here, has been incorporated into the mainstream culture ever since the 1995 Hollywood film of Apollo 13. 
It's often misquoted by people saying Houston, we have a problem. But he actually uttered was Houston, we've had a problem here. And if you put it together, the fact that this occurred the second day of the mission means it occurred on the 13th of April for Apollo 13. Now, it's not about the number 13. It's not any type of irony. It's just a matter of pure coincidence. And then the situation became even more alarming when the astronauts can look out their very small window and this is what they view. We are, uh, we are ready something. And that something turns out to be oxygen. So of course the media goes wild because now there is the fate of three humans in space. Who are we going to be able to bring them home? Are they going to be able to survive? Will they have enough oxygen? So the media becomes an absolute frenzy over this uh, precarious situation for these astronauts. And here's some footage from uh, back in the day. There is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. I assume you've called in your backup becomes. Flight, say again. Have you called in your backup becomes now? See if we can get some more brain power in this. We thing. got one here. Roger. At the moment, the astronauts are continuing to try to isolate their trouble. A late report says the spacecraft now is operating on battery power alone. All unnecessary equipment is being turned off. The media frenzy was in the homes of the astronauts' families as well. And remember the Voxes, the voice systems that allowed the astronaut families to hear what was going on at Mission Control. This happens to be Marilyn Lovell, the wife of Commander Lovell. And so you're leaking oxygen, or you've had some oxygen that was vented into space. You're now on shutdown running only on batteries, you're now using the LEM and the service module as one spacecraft. And this presents some unique situations you'll see here. And the Aquarius was the name of the lunar module. And they're utilizing both mechanisms and electronics and batteries from these two acting as one spacecraft. And as if there wasn't enough to deal with, we have this situation. The astronauts faced another problem, their own exhaled breath. The lithium hydroxide chemical to take carbon dioxide out of the air was not sufficient in the lunar module. They would have to adapt the canisters from the command module to fit the hoses in the LEM. On the ground, an adapter was fashioned from materials the crew had available in the LEM. Cardboard from a checklist, plastic bags, and tape. After checkout in an environmental chamber, the directions for construction were sent up to Aquarius. At this point in time, I think the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide was uh, reading about 15 millimeters. And we constructed two of these things and put them online, and I think within an hour, the uh, partial pressure of CO2 was down to two tenths. Now that clip really underplays, I think, uh, the severity of the situation in that the lunar module Aquarius was built by one engineering firm and the command service module Odyssey was built by an entirely entirely different engineering firm. The incredible engineering feat that was accomplished by these engineers is highlighted really well in the 1995 Ron Howard film called of course Apollo 13 where the actor portraying the engineer Tony England still shot from the film comes and says we need to make this fit into a hole made for this using only this. I happen to know that this actor is portraying Tony England because I had a former astronomy student of mine. She graduated with her bachelor's of science in physics and astronomy from Northern Arizona University and then went on to pursue her PhD at the University of Michigan where her department chair, so your professor who mentors you, was indeed Tony England. So here is Deke Slayton. Uh, presenting what the engineers managed to put together. And then I think something that's often overlooked in this remarkable moment is how they then had to convey step-by-step -step instructions to the astronauts to build this. 
they didn't have a set of instruction books with pictures and step-by-step -step items. This is a great skill in communication and technical writing and technical communications to be able to convey how to construct this apparatus that ultimately did save their lives. Everyone at the Mission Control Center on the ground is certainly breathing easier and most definitely breathing easier. With a richer environment of oxygen, the astronauts who managed to construct the device that was uh, communicated up to them just a real monument to human engineering. Just an incredible, incredible feat. With people breathing a little bit easier, the focus then was returned to... Now, people were still working in the background, obviously, in this. They didn't all stop to do this, but now a media focus was how are these gentlemen going to get back. With that explosion, how much damage was done to the exterior of the vehicle in having shut down the major electronics in the spacecraft. There was a decrease in temperature, and so they were only running vital systems in this uh, survival mode spacecraft, and the declining temperature made it very uncomfortable and then you had the problem of water condensation building up and that became a concern for everyone involved with water and electronic circuit boards obviously not being a good mix and everyone knew the choice that was made when they powered down the systems to be able to kind of stop take a check where are we at with this situation that landing on the moon was now definitely out of the question. So the original trajectory had to be modified so that the gentleman could return home safely. And this is where a very famous line that uh, Gene Krantz, the lead mission controller, comes from that has inhabited our culture, and that is the failure is not an option, that the gentlemen are here, we need to get them all the way back here, and definitely failure is not an option. Not only were they doing mass calculations on the ground in the re-planning of the uh, trajectory and re-entry orbit. This is Jim Lovell's scratch pad, essentially. This is the binder that had the, it's like the playbook for the flight, and these were his manual calculations. Of course, there's not these graphing calculators that we have today. This was uh, all done by hand, mental calculations, as you can say, see here in the margins. And just some more of his notes, as he was, of course, this is not what we're doing anymore. We don't have to worry about the landing gear. And so they're uh, making their notes of what they're going to have to do next or instead of. So major rewrite in the procedures. If there's some positivity to be taken from this, it's the fact that uh, the Apollo 13 crew have a Guinness World Record to their name, the highest absolute altitude attained by a crewed spacecraft, and that is the 400,171 kilometers, or just shy 250,000 miles from Earth, a quarter million miles from Earth. In comparison to the Gemini 11 mission, we told you the 850 miles, you can see this is a staggering difference. And so the record is still held by the U.S. So as they have made their major plans and made the what are called burns, as you need to change your velocities and the angles at which you were to return, the astronauts then had to separate from the command service module as reentry is just the Apollo capsule itself. And as they separated from the Aquarius module, they could see the damage that was done to the service module. And we'll show you that here. And there's one whole side of that spacecraft missing. Is that right? And the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, engine. Really a mess. Man, that's unbelievable. So that would be rather disturbing as an astronaut looking out. Uh, in particular, people were alarmed of, okay, how far up does this damage go? Did the damage 
affect the heat shield. So one of the things that is always with an Apollo mission is as astronauts make that big pass behind the moon and are out of radio communication, and then as they come through the touchdown splashdown sequence, normally it's about four minutes or so that you won't hear from the astronauts as they're not in uh, ability to have line of sight communication with radio waves. And so this four minutes extended into a very stressful six minutes, which certainly two minutes of silence when everything is just an edge of the seat, survival, bring these men home. That was just an extended level of stress for all the world that was watching at this time. When Houston does hear from Aquarius and they get confirmation of the splashdown, there is absolute jubilation and celebration. We'll see some of that here in this clip of the Apollo 13 splashdown. What a tremendous feeling that had to be to land on the ground safely. Here you can see the celebration and excitement of many of the NASA engineers. This gentleman right here is Gene Krantz of Failure is Not an Option fame. Hopefully he's more famous for his dedicated career to NASA, longtime flight controller and flight director for many, many NASA missions. This flight controller right here is Jerry Griffin. Managed to acquire his autograph. And if you've had Astronomy Universe, you know a great connection of Jerry Griffin to my all-time favorite film. And more of the celebration, congratulation, handshakes. You can see on the main television screen here, Commander Lovell. And here is a photograph of them on their aircraft carrier. Taken in the sunshine. Fred Hayes had gotten sick aboard the flight, and he uh, came down with a urinary tract infection due to the lack of intake of water. And Ken Mattingly, who was grounded from the Prime mission as pilot, or Jack Swigert, uh, filled that role. He ended up not contracting Rabella during his time in helping the astronauts return safely. Speaking return safely, doing their impression of uh, Abel and Baker. Here they are checking out the newspaper headlines. They are safe. President Nixon awards the uh, crewmen and the entire Apollo 13 mission operations team a congressional, or excuse me, a presidential Medal of Freedom. And a commemorative patch for their mission, so their original mission patch here. A commemorative one, the words that Fred Hayes uttered as they came away from their Aquarius and filmed the vessel. He said, farewell Aquarius and thank you, as the vessel had most certainly saved their lives and managed to bring them home along with the incredible mission control team. Many years on, this is a picture April 15th tax day 2010 we have fred hayes here jim lovell this is ken mattingly the one who was the original pilot for the mission uh, jack swigert unfortunately was not alive in 2010 as he had succumbed to cancer and this is gene krantz the mission controller jim lovell's hometown is chicago and this is the adler planetarium it's the north american continent's oldest planetarium and there's a nice exhibit featuring some of Jim Lovell's collection in the Adler Planetarium. Here's his uh, suit from the Apollo 8 era, the wonderful lap around the sun. His autograph on the report of the Apollo 13 review board, uh, volume one, volume two. And here's my copy of Jim Lovell's autograph. Any idea what this might be that's on display? A flashlight. How about this thing? Remember this mission was going to do some extensive uh, geological work and you don't want to come back from your mission and say it was great. 
You want to be able to give precise detail. And the astronauts have been trained by artists and geologists to be able to interpret better what they were seeing. And uh, also on display, the commander's helmet that Lovell would have worn as he walked on the surface of the moon. Here's the checklist on his cuff. So a little step-by-step -step procedures reminding of the mission steps. And they didn't land on the moon, so what would have been part of the craft to remain with the Aquarius was the plaque here. And it was kind of a unique plaque to begin with anyways, in that it uh, didn't have the typical expression of coming in peace for all mankind. Not that they didn't come in peace. If you're interested in reading more about this amazing engineering feat after feat after accomplishment after accomplishment of Apollo 13, there's this great book called Lost Moon, written by Jim Lovell and uh, the help of Jeffrey Kluger. There's also a book, The Apollo Adventure, about the making of the movie Apollo 13 in conjunction with the Apollo Space Program. Apollo 19, you'll see featured Fred Hayes, so another opportunity to perhaps walk on the moon with Apollo 19. On the 2nd of September, 1970, that mission was canceled. All right, what about Apollo 18? This would have featured Gordon Brandon Schmidt, and this mission was also canceled. So it was officially declared by NASA that the Apollo 17 would be the final mission to the moon. So several missions shorter than the original Apollo program had uh, been slated for and envisioned.